Welcome to the Impact Multiplier CEO podcast. If you're a chief executive or if you think like one and you want to create exponentially greater impact, then this show is for you. My name is Richard Medcalf, founder of X Quadrant. I coach some of the most successful and impressive CEOs and executive teams on the planet and help them achieve even more extraordinary results. Because no matter how successful you've been in the past, there's always a whole new level of impact available to you. So, if you're ready to play a bigger game than ever before, I invite you to join us and become an Impact Multiplier CEO. Enrique Sacao is the Chief Executive of Knipe, a leader in fund data management and reporting solutions for the asset management industry. And uh, today uh, we speak about a number of really interesting things. The first thing, the four things that really positioned him for the group CEO of this uh, very interesting business. Secondly, how did he turn the business around and sell it on within just 20 months uh, to Deutsche Börse, which is a huge, uh, huge company? He had what he calls the ABC method, and he will explain that in the interview. Uh, also about communication. Where is it important to really over-communicate? And how does that actually drive revenue? Uh, and finally, we get into a great discussion around the need to let go of things, to let the balls drop, not to sort everything out. When we're putting our attention on the important things, sometimes there'll be fires burning as an executive that we just can't get to, and it's okay. So this is a really interesting conversation. Enrique is a very fascinating person. He's Spanish born, he's lived in the UK, he's now living in Luxembourg. He's got a lot of uh, fascinating background and I think he's got some really practical management skills which come out so clearly in this conversation. So enjoy this conversation with Enrique Sacal. Hi Enrique and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me Richard. Hey, this is going to be fun because, first of all, you're a in very interesting individual. You're a, a musician and a historian turned uh, CEO, turned regulatory tech or data technology CEO. So there's definitely a story there. Uh, and then you've had a really interesting journey over the last couple of years. I know you were a divisional CEO within um, Equinity, and then you, you managed a £200 million profit and loss. You then, um, you then became group CEO at Knipe, and within 20 months, you'd kind of turned around that business, sold it on um, uh, to a much larger group, and you've kind of become a divisional CEO once again. So I think you've had a really uh, action-packed uh, couple of years. So I'm looking to find out a little bit about, you know, your learnings over that journey. Of course, and, and with great pleasure. I, I suppose I should say that the, the, the musician piece, I'm, I'm a bit of an imposter there, because I studied history as an undergraduate, and I wanted to do a PhD to write a book about the uses of music as propaganda. So not knowing anything about music, the advice I got was that I should do a master's in musicology, which I did at Oxford. But when I arrived at the music faculty, I was a bit of an alien octopus because I am not a musician. I studied the piano for two or three years as a teenager, like many middle-class people do, uh, but there was no real knowledge of the notes, you know, of, right. the, of the score. So they found me a bit strange, but I still, enjoyed it greatly and then I did the PhD in what I wanted but with some kind of grounding of how music gets studied so just to set the record straight should any musicians get offended uh, by, by being called a musician yeah yeah that's that I understand it I am um, yeah I'm a very much similar actually I, I play electric guitar well, I play guitar um right. but I, I, I say I'm a guitarist I'm not a musician <laughs> you know, I'm not, I haven't quite got there anyway um let's um Let's jump in. Before we go any further, do you want to tell, tell us a little bit about what is uh, Knipe um, and, and perhaps just a little context about um, what you were doing before and how you ended up in, in, in that business? Right. Look, my, my career after uh, doing my PhD in, in history and propaganda was always in financial services technology. I was at Exchanging, then I was the CEO in Europe of uh, FNZ Group, which is now the largest wealth management platform out there. Then I joined Equinity as the head of this rec tech business, Equinity Digital, and eventually can I. So my sort of background led me to, um, uh, to, to run in a company that's a data tech in the, in the financial services space, sort of regulated business uh, for kind of high touch um, financial services institutions. 
Um, what, what can I do in very simple terms is, is one of Europe's two leading data management companies. So we help asset managers particularly, and now increasingly distributors as well. But we help asset managers particularly to ensure that they can distribute the product by supporting them on the data journey. We start by registering their funds. Mm -hmm. We create all the documents, the, the key investor documents that are required for them to be on the market. We then disseminate those documents. We disseminate the data. And we make sure that everything we do, regulatory filing with regulators. So we make sure that every bit of data that's necessary for these funds to be uh, bought and invested in is out there in the market really. Got it. Yeah, so you're really a platform, you know, you kind of provide all the all the infrastructure so that people can then get on with the commercialization of those those products. Exactly. Yeah. That is correct, yeah. Got it. So so looking back, um what got you ready for that role? You know, or perhaps why do you think you know you were you were chosen as as the man for the job uh, in 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 Knipe? Was there a previous history you already had with that business? Um, yeah, what, what do they see in you? Do you think? And it's a hard question to ask, perhaps. Perhaps, but you know, what yeah, what was it? What was the angle that you brought? So they got in touch with me via headhunter. So I, I'd never met them before. I knew of Knipe, which is sort of, as I said, one of the leaders in Europe in, in, in data management. Um, I think they were, what they wanted about me was that I was the sort of, the uh, CEOs often are the ultimate generalist. So I had been exposed to all sides of a p the technology, the compliance, the growth, the product and everything as a divisional CEO, which I think is a good place to start before you become a group CEO. I had had a growth focus and that's what the board of Canai thought was the priority when I was appointed. I wonder if they knew what the job was, whether they would have appointed me or somebody with a different with a different background, but I'm happy to, to touch upon that. And then I think it was the relevant industry experience. And I think once I ticked those three boxes, it was a question of whether I was going to be temperamentally well suited to uh, join, join the team and, and, and the chemistry with the chairman and the main shareholder was just incredible from minute one and and that's how we got got it got it done tell me about the growth focus what kind of questions do you ask yourself or did were you asking yourself as you went into that business i mean the the the, the, the first question was is is what this business is the business model of this business right so is is what they're doing in demand because if what they're doing is in demand and the offering they have to market is adequate, then whether they're going through a good or a bad phase, going back to a music, to a music analogy there, is, is where you have to learn whether the problem is that the piano is broken or whether the pianist needs to learn how to play the piano. Yeah. So I sort of satisfied myself as I went into the job that the piano was okay, that there wasn't anything fundamentally wrong with the piano and that people wanted to go to piano research meaning asset managers wanted to listen to piano music. And, and, and on the back of that, whether the key challenge was growth or whether the key challenge was tuning the piano, whether the key challenge was you know, replacing the pedal, um, as ever, it's a bit of a, it's like opening a melon and until you've done it, you don't know how, how, how tasty it's going to be. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, I knew, uh, I think I got myself satisfied that, that, that there was something very solid there, even though very transparently the chairman and the, shareholder told me that there was quite a bit of fixing to do. And um, we didn't know the extent of the fixing that was required uh, when, when I joined. Yeah, well, my mind is actually racing with all these in, in analogies <laughs> of broken pianos and, 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 <laughs> and uh, over-mature melons. So uh, it's, it's a great <laughs> a great visual analogy. But uh, yeah, I think there's a difference about, yeah, so are there structural, yeah, is it, is it a structural problem that it's, yeah, that the business model is not responding to a need or is it that there's, as you said, more pragmatic uh, or more fundamental things just to just to tweak or fix in, within the system. Uh, so I know you've been a group CEO before, you know, you, you mentioned you, you've been very close to CEOs in the past. So um, what was the difference between perhaps moving from that group CEO role into, sorry, from, from the, the, yeah, the, the divisional CEO role into the group CEO role. So was there anything su that surprised you about that or, or ways that you had to adapt that perhaps you hadn't had to do before? 
Look, I, I, I think I knew the theory because I had been very close to this. I've been reporting to CEOs for a number of years and I carried the bag of a CEO before. Um, but, and, and I think there are four things I had realized whilst working with CEOs, group CEOs, that had, um, of course, uh, mattered to me enormously and were confirmed when I became one. Uh, it's right. only how they affect you personally that, <laughs> that's interesting. So yeah. one is, of course, that companies are not democracies. You know, it's ultimately... Everybody goes to the CEO with the, with the recommendations that the CEO has to make a decision. The second one, I think, is nobody is more incentivized than the CEO, the group CEO. And I'm not just talking financially, which is also true, but also in terms of career. I mean, we've all worked for CEOs that perhaps didn't do so well. And then we went to a job interview. It was never our fault. It was always the fault of the group group CEO, you know. And, 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 and that sort of career drive does matter enormously. The, nobody's more invested than the group CEO, and also the group CEO knows everything that there is to know. Um, so for me, the, 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 the challenge when I became the group CEO was, first of all, managing that level of investment and incentivization. So understanding, not, not letting it become my life, and I largely failed <laughs> to start with, of course, uh, the, as, as most of us do. The second one is, is kind of walking the line very carefully because between the statement companies are not democracies to create in a culture of, of of people just telling you what you want to hear and i will give myself a pass on that one i think I, it's something i manage well by establishing a culture of trust in which you know we have a conversation another musical analogy we all agree what this orchestra is playing we can disagree during the rehearsals but when we go on stage if anybody plays a different tune that person is very likely of course to leave the orchestra very soon um, and then knowing everything is how much you share and how much you don't share so we tend to uh, overshare on gossip and undershare on what the people need to know because then it's you know gossip is like currency you trade it for things and and it's a mistake I made early on so being too open about certain things and perhaps not sharing some of the fundamentals and ensuring that the whole orchestra knew exactly where we were going but these are kind of mistakes that you always make and and largely, I mean, I, I think I got them right and we will go to the right results. But, you know, it's when you're awake at night looking at the ceiling, these are the things that back you really. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, and this idea of oversharing and gossip because it provides some kind of emotional currency, um, but actually not giving people the business context as much. Yeah, how did that, you know, how did that happen? I mean, because I can totally see that. I can really understand that. I think it's a great, a great point. I, I think it's a really helpful insight. It's like, what am I actually sharing? Um, how did you come to that realization that perhaps you were not sharing the right things at the start? I mean, I, on the gossip front, I must say I did very little of that. So I was, I, I, I think I, I was good enough to avoid that because gossip is indeed very toxic. I think what. Um, the communications piece is when you're in a meeting or you hear a colleague of yours, a direct report of yours, talking about something in a way that's most emphatically not the music we had agreed to play without any bad intention. And initially, because you're full of fear and paranoia, you think, oh, what well, is this person trying to deviate from the party line? But in reality, is that you have not communicated the party line well enough and you have not double checked that the party line has been communicated. And I'll, I'll confess. Something. So we have tomorrow a, a workshop with all the sales teams to go through the main pitch of our main product. So something which is 50% of our revenue, very significant. And we replaced the technology last year, which changes the pitch very considerably. And over the last three weeks, I've been to sales calls with sales people, with clients, and I realized that they don't understand it. And of course, it got terribly frustrated with these people. Yeah. I didn't tell them, but I was frustrated. And then three days into the frustration, I thought, but this is your fault, again. That, that your biggest technology uh, investment, the, some salespeople in the company do not know how to explain it to the client, is ultimately your fault to fix the problem. So we're going to all go into a room tomorrow. The orchestra is going to meet up. We're going to discuss uh, this particular yeah. symphony until everybody understands why we spent money we didn't have at the time in buying this technology that has really transformed the future of Canada. I think it's really, it's really important. A lot of times I see companies going through transformations and one of the big issues is, ah, these sales guys, they, they don't know how to sell the new stuff. They're stuck in the old ways. But I think scratching on the surface, there's a real question about has, 
have really enabled them? Have we just ticked a box on a list of 20 things we need to do and sales enablement is one of those boxes? And I, I suspect that often we haven't actually done that work of um, really embedding that new message, right? It's, it's one of those high value activities. If you can just, if you increase the Salesforce confidence in what it is they're selling and why it really matters and what the differentiations really are, then it has a huge leverage effect. But it's not Absolutely. that sexy work, right? Doing that kind of <laughs> workshops and trainings and mentoring isn't that sexy, but I think it has a big effect. So of course. And also, if it's 50% of your revenue, you have to take it very seriously. So this is a workshop I'm leading myself tomorrow. But there is an element of, um, you, I, I, I work on the assumption that everything is my fault, you know, that when things don't work. And, and, and quoting a, an ex colleague of mine, um, he always said that people don't go to the office to do a lousy job. People don't wake up in the morning thinking, today, I'm going to mess up big time. That's not how employees operate because they go home happier if they do a good job and if they get a pat on the back. So if they, you're not giving them the tools to do a good job, then perhaps yeah. they have some right that everything is my fault. Yeah, I, I think it's a fantastic line. I, I've heard it before. I, I try and apply it to my own life. And I, I suppose for listeners, I want to make that point. Like, if you're not working on the assumption that everything is your fault, then actually, you know, you're disempowering yourself because you can't do anything about it you end up in a victim kind of stance and it means it is really hard to progress where if you really own everything and say everything is my fault in reality obviously you can't change everything but if you actually work on the basis it's my fault uh then all these things become possible um but you have, with that you have to give yourself some grace right you have to not beat yourself up about it Mm -hmm. but see it instead as, as empowerment how, yeah i mean how did you how do you find that do you, do, do, are you able to balance that like taking on the responsibility without beating yourself up? I think so. I mean, you have to delegate effectively, but if you delegate ineffectively, it's all false. So the, it's not that, I think the, the, the line to, to be very aware of is that we cannot, everything is my fault, doesn't mean I do everything. Mm. You know, it's your fault if you appoint the wrong people and don't remove them quickly. It's your fault if you don't delegate effectively. It's your fault if there is no clarity in communication. It's your fault if you don't take in feedback that what you had decided before is wrong and you should change course. Yeah. Of course, that doesn't mean that you have to do everything because otherwise it's impossible to scale. And, 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 and we all need to scale because we need to make room for other people to grow yeah. and we need to make a path for ourselves to continue growing. And I'm 43, I hope I haven't peaked intellectually yet. I'm not sure career-wise, I've gone back to being an admission at CEO, as you pointed out. But um, I hope I haven't leaked intellectually or something. It'd be quite sad. I feel I'm still young. So, so what about this question of managing the level of investment, right? You said you failed a bit at not letting it become your life. Um, so I'm curious about that, right? Because obviously a lot of these jobs are very involved and, you know, you really into that. Um, and so I guess my question is when you, when you talk about that, you know, is it like a kind of a humble brag as in, well, you know, I was completely into it, but that's the way it is. So I failed, but I'm, I was okay about it. Or was there actually like a cost to that that you felt you actually over-rotated and yeah, it kind of suffered as a result. It wasn't sustainable. I'm kind of curious as to, you know, was it just a totally immersive experience that was that was fun, even though you meant you were, you lost some of the personal side or do you feel that actually it was, it, it was a step more than perhaps you needed to go. I mean, I, I, I suppose I'll take a step back. I'm, I'm not a fan of the expression work-life balance because it sort of presumes that when you're at work, you're dead. And when yeah. you're at work, you're alive, which is something I, I am very much alive at work. I, I yes. love I, It's a very fundamental part of my enjoyment and my happiness in life. I think when I arrived at Kenai, it was really an emergency situation. I mean, the company was very, in a very bad shape and, and it required every minute of the day and, a lot of minutes of the weekend. I think on some level that became addictive. So once we turned the corner, which we did within, I would say eight to 10 months, and then you start feeling guilty because you go home at eight. That's not healthy and that's not right because a company of the size of Canada, which I cannot reveal, but it's not 200 million pounds like my previous PNL, should not require that I work 20 hours a day, every day of the week. No. It just should not require it. No. There's something I'm doing incorrectly if I need to put, on one, put in 100 hours to my um, But there was a getting used, you know, like to, to that. I, I read recently that Rafael Nadal, after winning in Australia, he, the first thing he went to the 
to the um, to the locker room and, and hit the bike, and he was pedaling for an hour and a half, which is what, of course, he was advised by his doctors to kind of calm down gradually and not ruin his muscle. There is a bit of that when you're working under the pressure of existential pressure. Yeah, right. Will we be here in three months or not? Uh, and what will my CV, the investment of the CV, what will my CV look like? If the market thinks I chose the wrong place and then I didn't turn it around. One thing is to be bad at due diligence. The other thing is to be bad at due diligence and execute. So you have all these anxieties, of course. And, 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 and then when you're at home on a Saturday and you do nothing on Saturday, because why would you incidentally? Um, it's, it's, you have this kind of thing in your mind like, oh, you're you know, losing focus now, Enrique. Go back to what you were doing three months ago. There was no need. It's Richard here with a quick interlude. As part of my coaching and advisory work, I often work with leaders who have recently taken on the CEO role. It's a big leap from the comfort zone of functional leadership or business unit management. And it opens up a whole new set of stakeholders, pressures, decisions, and responsibilities. I found that there are three key things that will make a huge difference in those first quarters. Number one, balancing the operational and the strategic, what I call CEO focus. Number two, establishing credibility, what I call CEO presence. And number three, managing stakeholders, those CEO conversations. I've written a short email series that goes into more detail on the transition to CEO and how you can practically sharpen your CEO focus, solidify your CEO presence and master your CEO conversations. It's insightful. And it's entirely free of charge and you can register for it by going to xquadrant.com forward slash go forward slash curve. Now, back to the conversation. Yeah, yeah. And it's actually often in those moments of relaxation that we can be creative, actually. Um, One of the things that really impact me is uh, is a phrase I, I heard somewhere. I've adopted it. I now steal it. Use it as mine. Which is, you know, you can be, you can be productive or you can be creative <laughs> in any one moment. And it's actually quite painful because you know, you know what? So much of the time we run around doing things, ticking things off our list, which, which is important. But creativity is the opposite of that. It is daydreaming a bit. It is having a blank piece of paper or trying and going in one direction. The music analogy, right? You know, you can't just sit down and write a masterpiece of music, like productively write it out at X notes per second, right? It doesn't work like that. It does You you sit there for two days and then you might get a breakthrough. Uh, But were those two days productive? Well, not at the time, they didn't feel it. They felt probably painful because you're sitting there with a blank piece of paper. Of course. So so giving yourself permission, I think is what I'm hearing. Give yourself permission to, yeah, not feel, to turn off. Yeah. So what would you, with all that in, in, in in your mind, you know, what's um what would your top tips be for for other new CEOs or people who are perhaps stepping up from a a, a divisional CEO role to having that full ownership? Because I know you've you've been there, you've you've been back again. Uh, what would your new tips be for those two kinds of individuals? I mean, it's a difficult question because I kind of give you the the owners one, which is think always growth, engage the teams, make sure you communicate. But some of the things I think we have touched upon already. If I were to, and I continue with the analogies, I suppose, but there are so many kind of balls on the table, kind of rapidly approaching the edge of the table, that you have to be comfortable letting balls drop and you have to be very comfortable letting things break. But it is, and here comes the analogy. I, I, I was asked in an interview what my best business training course ever was. And it was a first aid at work, which I took when I was doing my PhD 15 years ago. And, and it's the idea that, you know, you arrive at the scene of, a, of an accident and there is A, B, C, airways, breathing, circulation. If you focus on the blood and the patient has a blocked airway, the patient dies. This may be a very important thing in, in a company that's in crisis, but applied to less dramatic things like you win a deal or you don't win a critical deal 
if you focus on C when A is a problem, that's it. So I suppose the key advice, and, and, and I'm afraid there is no recipe for this, but the key advice um, to any uh, person who's becoming a group CEO is you must get that one right. So you must take the time that Saturday, that Sunday, even without realizing, to understand what's airways, what's breathing, and what's circulation. And you shouldn't even bother about D, E, F, because you have too much to do. Um, so letting balls fall off the table is inevitable. Mm -hmm. um, we all need to figure out um, what A, B, and C is in our business in a different uh, time as well, because A, B, and C at Canab in the first six months was different from A, B, and C before the acquisition by Deutsche Börse and A, B, and C now, for sure. Yeah. Uh, but I think we're all um, outrageously well paid not to get that one right. And if we don't get it right, then we should lose our jobs and move on and find another job somewhere else. You know, it's there is no, on that one, there is no, we can't win, it's our job. Uh, the job is that. So that is a piece of advice I would give to uh, to people who are coming into that role and, you know, just get it right. So, which means think carefully and devote time to it. You'll get it right sometimes, wrong sometimes, but actually it's got to be right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it's actually great advice because there's, there are so many voices, so many things calling on your time, so many fires that could be fought. Mm -hmm. uh, what you're saying is perhaps some of those fires need to burn because you can't do everything. Of course, and blood is so spectacular. Whereas an airway that's blocked, you cannot see it. Yes. You know, so you have to open the mouth and look for the, for the, for the cork that got stuck. Yeah. Whereas blood is there, it's inviting, blood is beautiful. You know, you see blood and you tend to it. It has this kind of red, hypnotizing red, black color. Yeah. And, and I'm afraid that that is, if, if you do that, your business will not go anywhere. Yeah. No, that's, that's a great, that's a great analogy, actually. And it's, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a call, as you said, to reflection, strategic thinking. Um, and what's hard is often people, I think, perhaps lower levels, you know, actually are almost asked to deal with the blood, right? Often, you know, they're, they're, they, that's where often you, you build your uh, success credentials is because you've made some dramatic invisible changes. Uh, I like that. Things that everyone's that's complaining. <laughs> Yeah. So sometimes, yeah, you have to move from. I don't know. There's some. Yeah. There's some uh, analogy. I can't quite get it. Yeah. But yeah, I, it's, it's. It's. But yeah. But it's a very vis visual image. I think it's. It's a fantastic image. So thank you for that. Uh, well, let, let's move on and let me ask you some of my little uh, quick fire questions. Uh, what's the favourite quote of yours that is kind of guides who you are or how you lead? Um, I think it's one from my mother because she, she always said to us, being right is not enough. It might not be even the most important thing. And, and as you need to kind of federate and negotiate and compromise, it's something that I've always kept in mind in business. I have colleagues who are all focused on being right. And I keep on telling them, yeah, you may be right, but if the rest <laughs> don't buy it, you are in a bit of a big goal with that. So that's my mother's, my mother's quotation, yeah. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, with our CEO group that I was I was running last week, you know, we talked quite a lot about you know it's better to have a, um, yeah, a set, uh, a seventy percent good idea with a hundred percent engagement and commitment, uh, way and execution rather than the opposite, right? Having a you know a hundred percent good idea, which of course is never a hundred percent good idea. It's just your idea, but at least you think it's hundred percent good with only seventy percent engagement and buy-in amongst the team. I think that's uh, it's really wouldn't important. agree more. Yeah. Yeah. What about a favorite? I mean, what about a favorite app or something you turn to on your phone that you know that perhaps keeps you going, makes you productive, whatever it is? Is there anything that, that's special for you on that? So before I moved to Luxembourg twenty months ago, uh, it used to be WhatsApp because I use it all the time. Now it's BBC Sounds, so okay. I can listen to Radio Three and Radio Four. I become, even though I'm a dual national, Spanish and British, I have all the cravings of British people abroad, like listening to Radio Four when you're in. <laughs> <laughs> making your cup of coffee abroad you know, you know in the wilderness of continental europe yeah that's that's pretty amazing you yeah because you're born spanish you've uh, <laughs> you live in luxembourg i think uh and uh, yeah you have to eat a dose of the bbc so i uh, nothing beats the bbc nothing I beats the bbc I, I do i do concur yeah <laughs> um how about a, a book what's a book that's perhaps really influenced you and uh, in the way that you think i think um so uh, if i had to choose a novel i would say east of eden by John Steinbeck, which I read 25 years ago, and it 
allowed me to understand family relationships. I remember being frustrated with my siblings being different from me before then. Mm -hmm. And then the book kind of taught me that it's a futile uh, thing and that they come from different generations. They come, so it's a very important book. And then if I could choose another one, I'm a very keen reader. Uh, I would choose Eric Hobsbawm, Nations and Nationalisms in 1780, which is a book that taught me a lot about how nations are invented, one of them, uh, no exceptions. And, um, and, and that mattered to me a lot as a person interested in history and politics. Yeah, well, actually, the well, whole question of nations and nationalism is a massive topic at the moment, right? I mean, our world, I think it's, uh, it's as big as it ever has been, if not more, <laughs> in many ways. Of course. What advice would you give your 20-year-old self? Fretless. Fretless. I would leave it there. Do you know, I was so full of fret. I was just, I was a happy boy. I've always been generally kind of a bright side of life type of person, but the fretting about the future, wait, what will this be? Will I do that? Fretless. Interestingly, at this CEO group I was running, it turned out a lot of people had quite a lot of, you know, they were often quite anxiety driven people, actually, mm. interestingly, you know, um, which has worked for them in one level, but it also creates that internal journey, which is, can be painful. And so on that, if I may, I mean, I don't want to make this section too long, but I mean, there is a thing to say when people go through a life changing experience and then they say, oh, this has given me perspective and I realized that work matters less and all that. Well, is that is great and I not had that experience so I cannot relate. The truth is that we were all relaxed and happy to enjoy life. Then there would be no innovation, there would be no yeah. medical advancement, there would be no rockets on the moon. So <laughs> that we are under pressure is okay because otherwise... Yeah. But the fretting is just so unhelpful. It's a, yes. it's a feeling that doesn't do anything for you. And yeah. You spend your 20s and your 30s fretting and you're like, God, no. So yeah, yeah so somebody once said, if you look back at it, all the things that you fret about, and none of them ever really happened. <laughs> exactly. And the really bad things that did happen, you weren't, you didn't, you kind of couldn't have possibly predicted anyway. So it's like, I really worry about a lot of things that actually happen. And so, you know, <laughs> um, so yeah, that, that's, that's great. Fretless, I think it's, uh, it's short, simple, and uh, I think it's, there's a lot of profound wisdom in that. What, Many of our guests, my best guests on the show, uh, come from referrals. So I'm always curious, um, you know, who's an impactful CEO? You know, perhaps somebody who's impacted your life, that you've worked with, or you work for. Um, you know, who, you, who you'd recommend as a guest for, for a future episode, and you know, what do you admire about them? So I could think of two, but one doesn't, as a matter of principle, do public speaking or interviews. So I'm going to mention the other one. So I'm going to mention Guy Wakey, who was the CEO of Equinity, who trusted me with running Equinity Digital. And the man was fantastically bright and is fantastically bright and incredibly articulate. What I did admire and what I learned from him was this discipline, that execution is ultimately, you know, you can think, you can plan, then there is, as Macmillan said, events, dear boy, events that get in the way. And the job is all about events <laughs> as it happens. As we say, the things you fret about don't materialize and all the things that you did not expect come from you, raining on you. And, and how this man managed to deal with events and how he was, you know, just driven by discipline. It was beautiful to see and, and something to aspire to. Really. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, yeah, discipline. Yeah, th thank you. That's, um, yeah, and uh, yeah, managing events because so often it's in those moments that real leadership comes out, right? It's what you have to do when things go wrong or when things yeah. happen. So thank you. And thank you for honoring him on that. Um, let's get to what I think is often my favorite question, which is thinking about the next level because that's the game I love playing with people, right? It's like, no matter how much we've achieved, there's always another level there's always another order of magnitude there's almost more we can we can do as you said you don't want to be peaking uh, uh necessarily you want to find the next next level so what's the opportunity for the business at this point you know where do you want to take it because i know you you came in you turned it around you you sold it uh sold it on you're still running the business where do you go from here i think it's a it's a quality journey so data is now everything in financial services. You know, they say it's the new oil. I don't think it's the new oil, but once you refine it, it does become the new oil. So for us to be the, the uh, 
go-to data provider on a global basis would be the thing to do. We regain trust of customers, some of which were pretty uh, unhappy with us because of the uh, lack of focus. And we're growing again, which is very pleasing. Now we have the deep pockets of Deutsche Börse behind to help us fund uh, growth. But I, I would like them to think of us as, you want quality, you go to Canide. And you go to Canide everywhere. So we'd like to be a provider that says yes, not a provider that says, oh yes, but not in Singapore, or yes, but we cannot do that product. I would like to be, you know, always a specialist, always data, always data management, always financial services in that part of the value chain. But I want us to be the best. Uh, we are fairly good, but but being perfect is still not there. And and, and we need to keep 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 going to that place. Yeah, beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. It's always inspiring when you hear people with that sense of attention to detail, right? Attention to will the service that can be created. Um, as I mentioned on another episode, it was Jeff Bezos, you know, who said you can, you know, you have missionaries and you have mercenaries, you know, who run companies. Uh, he says, you know, the mercenaries are looking to flip their stock and the, and the missionaries are there because they care about the product. Um, yeah, they obviously want to make a return too. And actually, normally they actually make more money than the mercenaries because they're focused on the value that they're providing. And I think it's, it's an interesting, uh, he writes quite a lot about it. He's, he talks quite a lot about that. It's quite interesting to, to hear those distinctions. So I, yeah, I love this idea of uh, knowing the, the lane you're playing in and then being the best you can be in that. So tell me, as you think about that, being the go-to data provider globally, being seen as you know, the best, the quality option, how are you going to need to multiply your own impact? You know, what will you need to do differently as a leader in order to release that next level within the business? I, I'll have to answer the question in two years' time, but I have to scale, and I'm asking myself the question. So now as part of Deutsche Börse, so I report into the group CEO of Clearstream, which is a large company, but then Deutsche Börse really is a very large company. I have a quite close relationship with them with one of the key board members there who runs all the post-trade business. And I'm, I'm watching the man and, and, and trying to understand how you manage a, a kind of 1.8 billion PL. Um, and, and whether I am, I know that I need to jump from where I am to that, but I would like to have a go at a, at a much larger show, but I would then have to learn that I don't perhaps need to know the name of every employee and uh, that I do not need to kind of uh, know as much as I do now. So which bigger balls I will let fall off the table to focus on much, much bigger balls that may be there that I don't even know about. Um, yeah. And that's, I think, my challenge for the next period. If I want to be a, you know, the CEO of a medium to large size company as opposed to remaining kind of, uh, the, yeah. the CEO of a small to medium size company, which is what I've done to date. I think that's actually a great way of framing the dis this idea of, of exponential growth, actually. Um, I think you put it in a really nice way, which is we often say what gets us here won't get us there. But if we go back to it, I think it's simply that we're used to keeping a certain size of ball on the table, if you like, and we're really, we get damn good at that and people like us and respect us for that. And then to really succeed at the next level, the, the, the ball that we were dealing with are no longer relevant, <laughs> almost. And so it's completely... They're rounding errors. They're, Sorry? Rounding errors. they're rounding errors. Yeah, they're, exactly. They're, they become rounding errors, exactly. So suddenly the things that you have built your rep professional reputation on, uh, if you focus on those at this point in your career, you're not going to succeed because you're going to be dealing with the rounding errors, as you say. And I think that's a great way of, of framing it. I think that's what I see a lot in my, in my clients. Um, who are already, you know, they're all super successful, you know, whatever stage they're at, a lot of them are, you know, running billion dollar companies or, you know, whatever, companies of all sizes. Um, or occasionally I'll run a program where there's more junior leaders, but it's still the same thing. It's just a different set of balls that they're dealing with. And it's all a question of, you know, which ones am I going to let fall off the table? Even though I know how to do it, if I focused on it, I could stop that ball. <laughs> but it's no longer the game, which I think is it's, it's, it's a great image, actually. So thank you for using Rachel. I'll probably steal that in future as well. So <laughs> it's, it's a great it's free, great it's free to use. It's free to use. <laughs> well, hey, um, that's, that's fantastic, uh, Enrique. If people want to find more, find out more about you or about um, Knipe, how do they do that? 
I suppose, can I do is you go to the website or you do a Google search and with me similarly, but if anybody really is very interested, they can always get in touch and I'm always happy to. Perfect. Great. Well, hey, this has been a great conversation. I've enjoyed uh, tracing your, you know, your experience from those days of uh, being a, a musical imposter uh, all the way through to uh, to this journey at Knipe and uh, and the turnaround and the whole conversation we've had here about what it means to uh, focus on the ABC uh, of the business and not get distracted. So, thanks so much for sharing your your insights and look forward to following the story. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Now let's talk about you. When you're in top leadership, when you're in the biggest role of your career, who supports you at a deep level as you lead others? Who helps you multiply your impact and get to the next level? If you're ready to learn more about our content, our coaching and our community, then visit us at xquadrant.com.